Over the last couple months, I've been playing with various techniques to grow ice crystals with varying degrees of success. This is going to be the first in a series of videos about the topic, and it's not a video that I expected to make. But when I was reviewing footage of ice freezing, just like a beaker full of ice in the freezer freezing, I realized that in that footage I could actually hear the freezing happening, and I thought that was really weird. What you're about to see is a video clip, not a time lapse. It's in real time with actual audio. So is that weird or what? I feel like I hear that noise every time that a waterbender freezes somebody in Avatar, but uh, it's, it's real. That's actually the noise that things make when they freeze really quickly. So while looking for ways to grow large ice crystals, I read a paper from 1995 very creatively titled Fast Growth Technique for Single Ice Crystals. In this paper, they describe a technique for creating single crystals of ice using a vacuum chamber. The water, thermally insulated from the bottom and sides, is cooled by intense evaporation into a vacuum. No other cooling procedure is required. So by evaporating water from a basin, they were basically cooling the water that was left over until it got cold enough to freeze. And they were doing this process with such precision that every time there was only one site of nucleation, ice grew out from a single point on the surface of that water. That's the difference between a single crystal nucleated at one point and a polycrystal nucleated from multiple locations at once. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to create single crystals using this technique. I was growing polycrystals. I had multiple nucleation sites on the surface of the water. But a lot of that might be because I wasn't actually following their procedure. I wasn't only using evaporative cooling. I was also using a freezer to sort of help the process along. However, even if I wasn't evaporatively cooling the water very effectively, in my case, the vacuum chamber served the much more important purpose of preventing condensation on the camera lens. If I just put a tripod in the freezer, the lens covers with frost almost immediately. But if there's no air between the camera and the water's surface, there's nothing to condense on the lens, so everything works out all right. My procedure was to put some water into a glass beaker and then place that beaker in a vacuum chamber, pump out the air, then place the whole thing in the freezer. Then I had to try to reach into the freezer to focus a macro lens on the surface of the water, despite the surface of the water being completely clear and transparent and that was not as easy as I'm making it sound. It's also worth noting, if you want to try something like this yourself, that for the couple days before the experiments, I was actually keeping my camera in my filament dry box full of desiccant, because every time you pull the camera out of the freezer, it's covered with dew, and I didn't want the insides of the camera where all the circuitry is to be covered in dew also, so I wanted to sort of dehydrate the camera. I also had to power the camera and lights externally. I couldn't use the batteries that came with them because if you try to put batteries in a freezer, the cold temperature slows down the chemical reactions and it makes batteries really no longer work like batteries. FYI. I started by taking a few time lapses like these. You can see out of focus water droplets wandering around in the background and the occasional bubble of vacuum boiled water vapor escaping from the beaker, then all of a sudden, ice. After a few of these, I realized the ice was actually forming really, really quickly. This process only lasted a couple frames of time lapse. And so I decided that since storage was cheap, I could afford to start taking 30 FPS videos instead of time lapses where I only got a frame every few seconds. That meant that there was a lot of waiting and a lot of paging through video of, you know, water. But once it finally got to the time of freezing, that let me capture some pretty awesome visuals of thin sheets of water ice expanding outwards in crystallographic directions amazingly fast. And then I noticed the sound. Here's the raw footage with original audio straight off the camera. The freezer itself was really loud, but for a moment, while the ice was freezing, there was like an extra sort of crackling noise. And then as soon as the ice stopped freezing, that crackling noise went away, and you could only hear the freezer again. After I cleaned up the background audio, this crackling noise was really, really obvious.
I sent one of these videos to my professor, uh, who is a material scientist, and he said that it reminded him of the freezing sound effect in movies. He said it sounded like Mr. Freeze from Batman, but uh, I don't think I've ever seen that. I'm imagining like the scene where Katara freezes Jet in Avatar, or the scene at the end of that Bond movie where the guy with the clicky pen gets uh, dumps liquid nitrogen all over him. The absolutely crazy thing is that that sound effect is actually the sound made by really, really quickly freezing things. So I'm amazed, because I've, I've never heard that in like real life before, I'm amazed that the Foley artists in charge of whatever the original freezing sound effect was decided that that was the right sound to use, because it's real, but it's like not something that I recognize, and I find that really bizarre. I was able to record multiple videos of this process occurring, and if we look at this other clip, we can actually see that originally the ice crystals grow really, really quick, but they don't actually finish covering the surface of the water. They slow down, and then they grow sort of smoothly to finish off the sheet of ice. If you pay really close attention, there are only crackling freezing noises during this first rapid growth phase, when the crystals are growing really, really fast. And this was my first evidence that this sound was linked to a physical mechanism called dendritic growth or dendritic solidification. The classic snowflake shape with the six pointed star is based on crystallography. The ice crystal has six fold hexagonal symmetry, but it doesn't actually want to make this crazy star shape. This has way too many free surfaces and surfaces cost energy. Every material is always trying to reduce its energy by basically assembling itself into a more stable configuration. In a perfect world, everything would crunch down into spheres, because spheres have the best surface area to volume ratio. But we don't live in such a thermodynamicist paradise, we live in the real world. In the real world, it's possible to do crazy stuff like cooling water below zero degrees Celsius and not having it turn to ice. This is called supercooling, and it's actually really common. If you just put a glass of water in the freezer, it's probably going to supercool before it freezes. The trick is that water won't form ice until there's already a chunk of ice in the water. By complete random dumb luck, somewhere in the liquid, a few molecules of water need to stick together in just the right shape to form a nucleus of ice. And once that nucleus is formed, the ice crystal grows outwards from that point extremely fast. Imagine there's a sheet of ice at zero degrees and you're a water molecule right next to it, bouncing around and running into other water molecules. The water is below zero Celsius and it wants to become ice, but you as a lone water molecule can't actually stick to that ice because you have too much energy. If you run into it, you'll just bounce right off. If you want to stick to that sheet of ice, you need to trick somebody else into taking your energy away. If you can offload some of that kinetic energy to your buddy, the next water molecule over, you'll be able to join the ice crystal. It is exactly like double bouncing someone on a trampoline. They get sent flying while you stop dead in your tracks. It's a transfer of energy. This process is happening all the time during crystallization, and it actually becomes the limiting factor when you're growing a crystal from a supercooled liquid. Because of this process, the water immediately next to the ice surface is actually warmer than the water farther away, because all of the water molecules that are hitting the ice and sticking have only done so by double bouncing the water molecules right next to them. This distribution of temperature is known as an inverse temperature gradient, where it's actually warmer close to the ice. Now imagine that things aren't quite perfect, and the surface of this ice has a bump. That bump protrudes into slightly colder water, which means it's easier for new molecules to stick to that bump, making it an even taller bump, reaching even further away from the surface into even colder water where it grows even faster. So this sort of self-sustaining process is dendritic growth, and this spike of ice is a dendrite and it grows outwards extremely rapidly. Once your dendrite gets really big, maybe it gets bumps on its sides, and then those bumps start growing outwards by the same mechanism, making another set of dendrites, and you know, so on. It's very fractally. You can even get dendrites that sink into the supercooled water. It's not like they can only grow on the surface. These, uh, these dendrites go everywhere. The trick here is that while you grow your crystal extremely quickly through this dendritic growth process, you end up with little pockets of warm water between all the dendrite arms. 
And I believe the clicking noises you hear during this process are actually formed when adjacent dendrites run into each other, trap little pockets of warm water, and crack. Most of the scientific research that's out there about dendritic growth is actually specifically looking at solidification of metals. Because, you know, we use metals everywhere, the solidification of metals is very important. This has, uh, let's see, three different types of metal in it at least. And dendritic growth in metals is really, really common. And specifically, when you're looking at welding and when you're looking at 3D printing of metals, which is basically like continuous welding, there's a phenomenon known as hot cracking. This was pointed out to me by a friend of mine in the department who actually studies 3D printed metals as his PhD research. And hot cracking is basically the result of thermal contraction. When you have liquid metal, it shrinks when it turns into a solid. If you get two pieces of metal, perhaps two dendrite arms that fuse together, there can be a little pocket of liquid metal in between them, trapped. In the case of metals, that liquid is going to shrink when it cools. So if it's in a completely closed off pocket, there's not actually enough liquid there to produce that pocket's volumes worth of solid metal. So it's either going to shrink and form a void, which is prone to cracking, or it's going to shrink and basically suck in on the walls, locally deforming the material and building up a lot of stress, also prone to cracking. In the case of a weld, you're doing all of this on top of a cold metal plate. So you're going to get even more thermal stresses when the molten metal cools down and shrinks, but the plate that it's on doesn't cool down and shrink. These thermal stresses are then very easily relaxed when you crack the material, and these cracks can open up between the solidifying dendrite arms. So this is why welding and really a lot of metal 3D printing is done by preheating the metal that you want to print on top of so that you can avoid some of these thermal stresses. In the case of water, the weakening of the structure and the cracking of the structure, I think, are actually being performed by the same mechanism. Expansion. Water, unlike metals, actually gets bigger when you freeze it. A certain volume of liquid water gets about 9% bigger when it turns into solid water. 9% is a huge difference. Like when you're talking about how much you can sort of flex a material before it cracks, <laughs> very few things can stretch 9%. That means that every time two dendrite arms trap a bubble of water, that liquid water doesn't actually have room to freeze. As it solidifies, it wants to take up more and more space, increasing the pressure inside of its little pocket, pushing out on the surrounding ice until it cracks. And when you have hundreds of dendrites growing out of a bunch of nuclei across the surface of water, you can end up trapping a lot of little bubbles and causing a lot of loud cracks. The really neat thing is that in this other video, where the ice sheets are just growing with flat sides instead of dendritic growth, there's actually no crackling noise everywhere, just, you know, the occasional click. So this agreed with my explanation. No dendritic growth, no cracking. But then I came to clip number four, and I was confused. This is very clearly showing dendritic growth. In fact, it's really, really beautiful dendritic growth, with these tiny little wispy filaments of ice forming everywhere. But I didn't hear any cracking. To make it weirder, once I cleaned the noise out of the recording, there was actually a blip in the audio track that I could see. And it was during the dendritic growth. It was exactly when I would have expected to hear a noise, but I couldn't hear it. Turns out that these dendrites are so much smaller and finer that they actually make higher pitched noises when they break. It's like, you know, small tuning fork versus big tuning fork. And these noises were so high pitched that they were above the limit of my human hearing. Or at the very least, they were above the limit that my desktop speakers were able to reproduce. All of that said, I want to clarify that this is at best a hypothesis. In science, we always have to sort of temper our results. With the data, the, the, the four videos of this process happening that I have recorded, I can say that the crackling noises occur during dendritic growth, during this kinetics-driven, very, very rapid branching growth of water ice. But as soon as that process slows down, and presumably the water has warmed up to the point where you no longer have the inverse temperature gradient, so you can't grow dendrites anymore, 
When we just have ice growing normally, there isn't any noise. Based on some level of intuition, trying to reason out what could cause this to occur, as well as looking at literature and looking at dendritic growth and cracking in dendritic growth in other material systems, I think that the mechanism that I've proposed in this video for why growing, rapidly growing ice makes loud cracking noises is pretty reasonable. In my actual work, if I have a materials problem, 99% of the time I turn to microscopy. If there is something that I don't understand about a material, chances are if I look at it smaller, <laughs> I'll have a better chance at figuring out what's going on. So if anybody out there happens to have a microscope with a really high speed camera attached, I would absolutely put in the time to make this little freezing process repeatable in such a way that we could look at it with a high speed microscope because I think that that would be awesome. Maybe we could actually see, you know, dendrite arms cracking apart. <laughs> That'd just be way cool. So I hope that you found this interesting and remember to subscribe for the rest of this series about ice crystals as well as many other projects that I'm working on and thanks for watching.